Manchester United's 1998-99 season began with defeat at Wembley to defending Premier League champions Arsenal. That day, at the beginning of August in the Charity Shield, there was no suggestion that Alex Ferguson was about to lead his club to the most successful campaign in British footballing history, and an achievement that remains unmatched. But that is exactly what happened. By the mid-1990s, Alex Ferguson had grown frustrated with Manchester United's recruitment. The club were a PLC and obliged to balance their on-field ambition with obligations to shareholders. And it meant that United, who'd spent just £12 million in the summer before and just £10 million in the summer before that, were being routinely outspent by Liverpool, Arsenal, Newcastle, occasionally Blackburn Rovers and nearly all of the European heavyweights. The summer of 98 broke that trend. Dutch centre-half Jap Stam was signed for £15 million from PSV, and Swedish winger Jesper Blomqvist joined from Parma for £6 million. Ferguson's main target was Aston Villa forward Dwight York, and nothing better illustrates the restrictions of the era than the fact that United had to delay the completion of that deal until mid-August, at which point its cost could be deferred to a different accounting period. But this wasn't just about strengthening the first team. United had suffered in Europe throughout that decade, the experience of which left Ferguson with two main conclusions. One, that continental sides kept the ball far better than English teams. And two, that the best teams were tactically flexible and comprised not just starters, but squad players capable of multiple roles. So, by the end of that summer, he had four forwards capable of playing in several combinations a midfield combining world-class players and specialists, and behind them, a newly strengthened defence and an outstanding goalkeeper in Peter Schmeichel. It was enough to snatch the Premier League back from Arsenal by a single point. They began the season carelessly, but would remain unbeaten between December and May. And their football was exhilarating and diverse. They could still counter-attack, their delivery and threat from wide areas was lethal, and in Dwight York and Andy Cole, they had a rare first-choice strike pairing. Cole was a superb finisher, blessed with great pace and skill. York was even more rounded. He was also a first-rate goalscorer and terrific in the air, but with great vision also. In the FA Cup, which they'd win after a processional final against Newcastle, United's progress foreshadowed qualities they'd need later in the year. They eliminated Chelsea with Phil Neville man-marking Gianfranco Zola, a tactical sleight of hand that Ferguson had acquired. And that came after they'd knocked out Liverpool in the fourth round with two late goals from York and Solskjaer. In a semi-final replay, they'd conquer Arsenal at the end of 120 minutes, which had seen them a man down for an hour and having a stoppage time penalty given against them. United were ahead of the British footballing curve. Eric Cantona's success, for instance, owed much to other Premier League teams not really understanding how to defend a deeper lying forward. In Europe, there was no such advantage. While the English game also emphasised speed and power, European competition privileged the ability to retain possession and nullify opposition strengths. United had built towards 98-99. They'd reached the semi and the quarter-finals of the Champions League in previous years, but that season saw them redress the shortcomings that had derailed their European campaigns of the past. In the group stage, United would contest a pair of exhilarating draws against Bayern Munich and Barcelona. The two Barcelona games finished 3-3, and the second of which provided a famous signature of United's cosmopolitan class. For their second goal of that night, York stepped over a pass, allowing it to run to Cole, received a ball back from his strike partner that he immediately returned, and then Cole carved in one of the finest goals in the competition's history. In the quarter-final, United would take a two-goal lead over Inter Milan to Italy, and Ferguson would throw one of his tactical curveballs, pushing Ronnie Johnson into midfield to help subdue Ronaldo. They'd survive and advance to face Juventus. In the first half of the first leg at Old Trafford, Juve were comfortably the better side and might have been more than one goal up. Ferguson's wide midfielders, Beckham and Giggs, really operated as wingers, leaving Manchester United's midfield badly outnumbered. This time, they had the capacity to adjust and reclaim control. Beckham was moved inside and played more conservatively after the break, 
while Giggs was given the more aggressive role, and he'd equalise right at the death. The semi-final second leg might be that team's defining performance. 2-0 down within the blink of an eye, Roy Keane and Dwight York would score to bring United level by half-time. Keane would also collect the second yellow card that left him suspended for the final. But by the time Andy Cole tapped into an empty net to finish the tie, Paul Scholes had also been booked and would be missing in Barcelona as well, denying Ferguson his first choice midfield. So, on to the famous night at Camp Nou against Bayern Munich. Teddy Sheringham's late equaliser and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's last gasp winner are part of footballing history today. So too is the image of Sami Kofor, pounding the turf in frustration as the trophy slipped Bayern's grasp. But that night was about the subtext. Sheringham and Solskjaer were perfectly used substitutes. Ferguson had also constructed a makeshift centre midfield pairing out of Nicky Butt and David Beckham, with Giggs moved to the right and Blomqvist down the left. It was team football, not just a case of sending out the 11 best players with a rigid game plan, as had previously been the English way. Manchester United were able to reach the mountaintop that year, but only because they'd learned to climb it in a different way. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic brings you the best sports journalism in the world in a personalised experience, connecting you with the stories and teams that you care about the most. There's coverage of 13 sports, plus direct access to world-class journalists through live Q&As, discussions and podcasts. And you can try it now for free for 30 days by clicking the link in the description.